go take you places. They're deeply purifying and they create a lot of internal heat to purify. So that's their purpose, to hold energy in. Okay, devas and devatas, turn to page 192, please. And I'll just, I know we've kind of glossed over Kundalini. It has its own section. We'll get to it. I, I'm going to get to it in Fire Week. So I want to just uh, put a definition here for you that I have in my phone. So give me one moment so that we have an understanding, a definition of Kundalini. Let me see. All right, Kundalini, worshipped as the goddess in many tantric traditions. I know I said Kundalini is the evolutionary force, right? You guys remember that? I'm going to make a longer definition. Worshipped as the goddess in many tantric traditions, Kundalini is the innate power within biological life that propels it towards evolution. The innate power in biological life that propels it towards evolution. It is the evolutionary tension that drives growth. In the human psyche, this energy is often managed or made dormant by an overly rigid personality structure. Slash ego. I'll say that again. In the human psyche, this energy is often managed or made dormant by an overly rigid personality structure slash ego. When the ego loosens its grip, Kundalini rises to create change in the organism. When the ego loosens its grip, Kundalini rises to create change in the organism. This has an inner alchemical effect. The reason Dooney works is because you are submitted to a process. That's it. There's the fire, there's the mantras, all that stuff. And it's holding your ego in place for long enough for the ego to basically have to let go. How many times did you let go last night? More than, more than a dozen ongoing. So it's like, oh, great. Like, oh, now I'm wrapped on this thing. Okay, okay, I'm working. I'm working, I'm working. Uh, yeah, all right, and then I'm like back. And it's like, oh, I'm over here. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. Uh, and so that process is just removing obstructions. Does that make sense to you guys? It's just removing the obstructions that are preventing that Kundalini from doing what she wants to do, which is to bring you back to source, bring you back to alignment with life. Share the definition later. Yeah. Somebody? Notes, yeah. Audrey, you can share a definition later. I'm in a really big pain right now, so it's hard to oh. take notes. Oh, okay. I got it. I'll post it in the group. Does anyone have that one? That was from today. It's, so I'll, I'll say the whole thing one more time. Worshipped as the goddess in many tantric traditions, Kundalini is the innate power within biological life that propels it towards evolution. It is the evolutionary tension that drives growth. In the human psyche, this energy is often managed or made dormant by an overly rigid personality structure or ego. When the ego loosens its grip, Kundalini rises to create changes in the organism. This has an inner alchemical effect. Kundalini. The reason worship is a spiritual technology is because through worship, we get over ourselves. We, hon we honor something that is beyond us or greater than us. The word worship, the etymology of the word worship, I like looking at etymology because it makes sense to me. What does the word actually mean? 
The word worship means to acknowledge the worth of fill in the blank. That's all it means. Acknowledge the worth of. So what would be the first and primary thing to worship? What do you think? Yourself. But you're not your small self, right? You're, yeah, yeah. So Daksha's yag, Yagna, there's a story, there's a mythological story about this cosmic duni that took place. <laughs> you guys want to hear this one? Yep. This is the cosmic duni. And it was at the beginning of creation. And Brahma, the creator, had his son Br Prajapati, who was like the royal kid. You could picture kind of spoiled, had everything he wanted. It was like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the creator's son, and like I can do whatever I want, kind of thing. And so he decides he's going to throw a big duni, a party, a duni, <laughs> that he invites everybody in the universe to, except for his daughter, because his daughter fell in love with Shiva and ran off with Shiva. And Shiva was like this, like, he, uh, he was basically a, uh, a dropout. Shiva was the wanderer. He, he wandered around with dreadlocks and hung out in caves and meditated on top of hills for 10,000 years. And, and basically was, he was the epitome of not giving any fucks. Yes, yes. And he was like, I'm not cutting my dreadlocks. <laughs> because Shiva was, is, is the supreme, an aspect of the supreme reality. And so when Prajapati's daughter fell in love and ran off with Shiva, Prajapati was like, oh, you, you're no longer part of our family. And Sh Shiva didn't care on his behalf, but he cared on his girlfriend's behalf. And he was like, that's BS. But whatever. It's like, it's okay. We, we have a whole other, we have our own universe, like, whatever. <laughs> but then when he threw the Dooney and he intentionally invited everybody except for them, Shiva was like, this guy is starting to get on my nerves a little bit. And to make a really long story short, what ends up happening is the... Shiva hears about this party where he doesn't get invited to, doesn't care. He hears that his wife, who is the, the daughter of Prajapati, also didn't get invited, and he takes that as an insult. He's like, oh, you can insult me because I don't care, but don't insult my, my beloved. And so he shows up to the party, shuts the whole thing down, cuts off Prajapati's head, <laughs> does this whole, like, this whole, well, actually, part of the story is that the daughter gets so upset that Shiva doesn't get invited because she realizes that her family has disowned her, and so she sets herself on fire. She turns herself into a, a, a what do you call it, immolation? 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 I can't remember her name. I'll have to, oh, wait, no, I do remember. It's, uh, it's not Sita, it's... Uh, la, 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 la. No, it's not Sita. It's a it's it? No. What would you say, Owen? No, it's another it's something like Sia something. Okay, we'll, find we'll find it. We're close though. So she sets herself on fire, which is the representation of the ego being incinerated by Kundalini Shakti when it's uncontrolled right this is a mythological narrative explaining the symbolism of this process when it's uncontrolled and things aren't coherent because prajapati brahma's son represents the ego so when the ego decides it's going to do things its way and it wants it to be super cool and it initiates a beautiful elaborate ritual process we're talking about ritual process that's why i'm bringing this story up our first step of worship is to honor the self, honor the supreme reality. First, before we do anything else, we have to acknowledge and honor in order for it to be truly effective for all things, honor that which is our source. That way we humble ourselves. 
If that's not taking place, then we risk the Shiva coming to our party and hey, you didn't invite me? Let me just show you this. Give you a little lesson. And so Shiva turns into Rudra. Actually, that's where Shiva turns into Rudra because Rudra means the howler, the one who is crying and wailing. And so Shiva turns himself into Rudra and travels around the whole universe crying and carrying, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. Her body and her body parts are falling over and then becoming rivers and becoming lakes and becoming all these beautiful things because Shakti still generates beauty. And so he's carrying her body and then the 50 body parts, there's places in India where this, where you can go and there's their pilgrimage sites because they say that part of her body fell there. Parvati. It's not Parvati. Not in this story. They have many different names for the same being, but different names depending on the story. Yeah. So, so Prajapati learns his lesson because now he's headless, doesn't have a daughter. Shiva says, if you're ever doing that again, make sure you invite me. Because I, I'm the ruler of the universe, don't you forget. I am the absolute. Everything returns to me at the end. So it's better to align in, to reality first before trying to do things your way. So I'm just presenting that story because it's uh, connected to Kundalini. It's connected to the ritual process. It's connected to the Duni. It's connected to our intentions and, and what we're bringing each time we come. So yes, come with your individual intention for sure and piggyback that individual intention on the primary objective, which is bringing beauty and harmony to all. Right? Help me align with truth first. If there's any left over for me, I will gratefully and graciously receive it. That ensures that you remain in balance and that things are flowing in a good direction. Okay, who wants to read The Power of Archetypes? Por favor. Jack. To piggyback on the topic of Kundalini and the Goddess, we must talk about the power of archetypes and archetypal energy. Archetypal psychology emerged out of the work of a man named Carl Jung, who is famous for his work covering what is known as depth psychology. You all know have heard Grant talking about depth psychology. This framework helps early psychologists understand the inner workings of the mind and human ego by working to develop an underlying philosophy for all possible behavior patterns. According to Jung and others, there are what can be considered basic patterns of psychic function. When the human psyche does not develop fully to reach a mature, healthy, and complete state, specific patterns of the psyche are inaccessible via the consciousness of the individual. What this means for the individual is that they are ruled by unconscious forces instead of conscious behavior choices. The science based around this line of psychology is profound. It offers significant insights into the nature of human behavior, why we do what we do, and what to do about it. How does this fit into yoga? Well, let us think for a moment. What are we trying to do with our yoga practices? What do these practices provide to us? How exactly do they help us? And what is the end goal to be achieved? Why do they make it such a big deal in Tantra to worship different deities? What does Hatha Yoga have to do with containing archetypal energy? Would anyone buy an audiobook by Jack? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like, wow, this feels good. <laughs> If you turn on to the next page, there's the discussion and notes section. What stood out for you in that? Or what, what, what came into your awareness as you were reading that? It's like whether we like it or not, there's basic building blocks of the human psyche. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we choose through our own self effort, we can like first recognize that objective truth and work with it in order to like live a balanced and, and happy life. Yeah. And if we and if we become aware of the you know this basic truth like the basic building blocks of our operating system, but still push them away, then we're like actively in choosing to, to create a chaotic life for ourselves with imbalance. Mm. Yeah. To hide from ourselves. And, and hide from ourselves. To Lula, you had one. Exactly. And that's beautiful because, as you said, you don't have to know how it's working. Just by doing it, it has this effect. And this is the, these are the reasons why. It's really cool. Michelle. Um, what stood out to me was just the question about why you think they have so many deities. And I was like, it's so awesome that so many years ago, they already knew this. They were mm-hmm. practicing it. I mean... I don't know when Carl wrote his book, but they already had it figured out. Totally. They had it figured out. Yeah, the, the Tantra philosophy, as you, if, if you spend time researching and looking into it, first of all, it is a massive, bigger than yoga. Yoga is actually sm- a smaller system in terms of the amount of material and content in it than Tantra, which is mind-blowing. We're talking a thousand years plus of of um like like uh not just books but like transmissions right like deep deep like people who spent their entire lives dedicated to a path and refining that what they received from their teacher and then adding a few lines to that story it's so profound yeah it's it's a uh, yeah pretty cool Someone over here? Did you guys have something? Yeah, Jen. I, well, I love the idea. Like, when you look at archetypes or deities, like, there's not that many choices in the human experience. Like, we're not that fucking different. It's not that complex. Like, we all have the same tiles to choose from. There's only so many combinations. Right. Like, so when we think it's like, oh, my shit's so unique, it's not. (laughs) Yeah, no. (laughs) Totally. Everybody has a version of it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Something my a mentor of mine once told me is like, everyone's afraid of something. We're all a bit. We were all a baby once, and no one's got their shit together. <laughs> so yeah, let's just put it plainly. Anything else that stood out for you guys? Yes, Casey. Mm-hmm. Because it really is just a different way of explaining the same thing. Yes. And it's interesting how like the Western world finds meaning through like psychological or even neurological, which is all inside. Yeah. But in the Eastern world, they find it more, or at least in these traditions, they find it more in the world beyond them. Yeah. So already some. Mm-hmm. Whenever they start to think about it, they're already looking outside of themselves rather than focusing on inside of ourselves, which is kind of what we're trying to do yes. the whole time. So it's really neat that they have representations for all these different emotional or like neurological things that are happening. Exactly. That, yeah, there's like, yeah. I thought it's just really cool to think about. Yeah, yeah. I like that insight. Yeah. I, I resonate with you. Yeah. Yeah, remember the, one of the first principles or one of the principles of, of Tantra is everything that is outside is also inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, piggybacking off of that and like tying 
bring some of it together. I think it was in one of Svoboda's books, it says to worship Shiva first become Shiva. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yes, it's outside, but we're recognizing it outside so that we can become it and like mm -hmm. see it outside of ourselves first and know how to bring it into yeah. the world. It's like you're already understanding that you are the other, yeah. the other is you. It's like you don't have to learn that. <laughs> it's already present. It's already, it's already yeah. presently and obviously the case, yeah. right? And that's what they're saying is like, we are all one. And here are the ways that we are constellated together. Like we're, we're acknowledging the, the world outside is, is our projection. Like, first of all, think about that for a moment. That everything you see is there because you are seeing it. L literally. And so we're looking into a hologram of our own projection. <laughs> it's like... I exist inside of you as a little me. You exist inside of me as a little you. Where are we actually? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> right? And that's why when we're like, Om Bayere 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 Nama, and we're all 16 of us trying to triangulate that single point where it's emerging from, click! We get that spark of awakening and you're just like, oh, I get it. I get, I, 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 not only do I get it, but I am experiencing where the origin is. That's different than being like, oh yeah, we're all one, bumper sticker. Like Kaylee said, Shivo Budva Shivam Yajayat. After you become Shiva, you can worship Shiva. Uh, it's from uh, one of the tantras, I can't remember which. Yeah, it's from Svoboda. Shivo Budva Shivam Yajayet. Yajayet. Excuse me, Yajayet. Shivo Budva Shivam Yajayet. Y A J A Y E T. And that's, that's a, it's also in the Pashupata Sutras where we're talking about Surya Namaskara. He says that first, like in the beginning of your worship process, and this goes into the idea of like your, the effect of your, uh, the results of what you're doing is dependent on the condition your mind is in when you do the thing. Cause and effect. So if, if, the, if how your mind is oriented when you go in to do your practice, that's going to change the result. That's why the first Yoga Sutra is We're not looking for the goal in Shavasana. We are actualizing the goal now, and then we are taking ourselves through a realization process of continuing to actualize the goal. It's the paradox that we're not trying to get anywhere, and that we're still working towards a goal. Kind of mind-blowing to me. So become Shiva and then worship Shiva. It's like It's like... Another way of thinking of that, I think, would say, like, honor and acknowledge that there's a spark in you that is the supreme reality, that is the source. That's beyond the ego. Acknowledge that part and then go through the process. That way your ego can be transformed. Because otherwise the ego is just trying to get stuff. It's trying to get something out of it. Okay, um, any last thoughts on ritual, on uh, archetypes? Okay. Are there only four? No. There's as many as you want. There's as many as you want. <laughs> if you look on the other page, self-reflection, the archetype of Durga. 194. You guys got a picture of Durga there. Um, I'll probably tell you the story of Durga tonight when the cicadas die down and, it, and we have candles and it'd be, be a little more moody. Um, 
but what I will present to you now, because I don't want to get too much into this. First of all, the, the lecture was, was more about presenting the idea of the devas and the devatas, as in there are these forces beyond us. Like they, in all the mythological stories, there's the perennial battle happening between the forces of good and the forces of, of dark. That's the, it's just the ongoing battle, the celestial battle that's happening in all the different stories. And so you're like, hmm, what is that? What are they saying? And my, my interpretation of that is just, it's this tension of creation and destruction that creates life. Jen and I were talking about that at the river. It's this ongoing tension process. If everything was always bliss, we'd probably get bored. You wouldn't even know what bliss was. You wouldn't have a definition for bliss. Exactly. Yeah, we need the contrast. It's like gardening and composting. Gardening and composting. So there's destructive forces, there's constructive forces. They both play a role in creation. And when we're talking about the devas and the devatas, I'm going to read, I'm just going to read this from you because I, I had this. Um, so this is from the Sri Vidya tradition. This is a tantric tradition. Sri Vidya, V-I-D-Y-A. And this is the, I can't remember the actual name of who is the, like the presiding master at the ashram in India. There, there is somebody who this is coming from. But for all intents and purposes, it just says, Guruji, like an endearing title for the master. He says, for most of us, life is a struggle. 90% tension and 10% happiness. We are all suffering from some problem or another all of the time, whether created by ourselves or the society we live in. Society demands conformity. We are punished if we do not conform to its standards. Most of the time, we can't solve our problem all by ourselves. We do need help. First, we do seek and we get help from people known to us. But the people we know are very limited. Maybe only a few in the entire population. Next, we consult the internet to get help. Even that cannot solve our problem. If nature is disruptive. Because nature can be violent, as for example, in extremes of hot and cold, tsunamis, volcanoes, hurricanes, breakdowns in power of communications. He says, nature can also be wonderful and lovable. We can get unlimited abundance. We can get unlimited abundance and powers, not only from people, but also from all of, the na all of nature when it, when it is controlled. We call the unseen controllers of nature Devas and Devis. Devas and Devis. That basically means the gods and the goddesses. The unseen controllers of nature. Right? Like we can't see gravity, but it's controlling us and it's making sure that we stay planted on the earth. Gravity is an example of a Deva. Right? The wind is an example. The sun. What, what controls the sun rising and coming over the sky? Right, we just take that for granted. But there's some cosmic principle at play that is ensuring that that happens. There's some cosmic principle ensuring that seasons take place, that rains happen, that water evaporates and become clouds. There's, there's unseen forces that are ensuring an organization of this crazy place that we call life that made sure that from, from inception, things or self-organized and became a reality that was uh, habitable. Yes. Is yes. A Devi, technically. Deva is the god, Devi is the goddess. Because you add the I and it's connected to Shakti. And they say Shiva without his Shakti is, guess what? Shava, corpse, doesn't have his Shakti. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Shiva without his Shakti is Shava, corpse. Shavasana. And Shavasana is an S with a dash over the S, which ma makes it sound like sh. Shavasana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Life needs its life force, right? That's why they say the two are inseparable. 
And that's why when we uh, don't invite Shiva to the party, he gets mad and he causes everything to blow up. To get help from nature, we have to follow its law. You guys ready for this? This is what we're doing with the earth altar. First, we have to sow before we can reap. That's what you did this whole week. You guys have been sowing. You know what sowing is? It's taking the plow and digging the fields. <laughs> it's getting in the earth, getting dirty, getting real. That's why I was like, you can't celebrate before you work. You got to earn the celebration. So before we get to get help from nature, we have to follow its law. First, we must sow before we can reap. This means we have to give first before we can get help from the controllers of nature. Help from goddess nature is what we really need to solve all of our problems and enjoy our life in peace. We have to move more from an I as an individual to we as an individual. We have to join as a team and work towards a common goal. One common goal can be empowering each one of us and the team. Do you guys feel like we have a common goal of empowering each other and the team? Right? We're empowering the individuals and the collective effort. But <laughs> Jack goes, fuck yes. It says, to achieve this goal, we will create a simple team building event, which is the building of an altar. I love this. This is the last thing here. These, pow these are power diagrams, and they're known in all cultures. If you look at all cultures, there is some form of, of a power diagram, like the mandala um, or, or, or circular representations of beauty, spirals. Each one of us gets to put our life force into its center. We will call the powers of the fire, the sun, the moon, and all elements. And then we invite the unending happiness flowing from the blending of feminine graces and masculine powers. He's saying some other things. Da -da -da -da. He's just talking about like what happens if we join a hundred of us as a team, then each one gives one of their life energy units to the circle, then we get a hundred times a hundred back because exponential. Right? That's the potency of working in a team. Letting go of alienation from each other, letting go of the competition of like, oh, if you get what you want, I won't get what I want, right? Letting go of the idea that like, I need to win and in order for me to win, you have to give something up. Like we need, we erase that and we work together towards this common goal and life becomes much easier because we are surrounded in a field of love and light and laughter. So that's just a really brief share from this unknown being, Guruji. <laughs> Guruji. Sri Vidya. Um, I thought it was relevant, so I was sharing it. Thank you. You're welcome. So we all have our own personal relationship with nature, and that is our Shakti. That each of you has a unique ability to connect to life outside of some imposition from the way the world has told us that it should be. We have our own way of communicating with plants and animals and, and these things, right? You get, do you guys have your own way of doing this? You don't need me to be like, you need to do it like this. No. It's like, I don't, I don't I'm figuring it out for myself. So um, for the next hour, it's 2.10 now or an hour and 20 minutes, however long, um, we will invite in all of this beautiful life that we see around us and we will have our time to go and make our offerings and connect to the land and connect to the spirits here and give our thanks if you haven't already done that. Um, and, uh, and I'm not like massive, we don't want the whole room. But bring your Shakti here, bring your, your, let's make our collective altar and um, together tonight in our ceremony, we will, we will share our intentions for the new year together. We will enter into a ce ceremonial space in a, in a 
and um, a shared ritual process of inviting those forces in to support us in the coming year ahead.